All right, good to go. All right, thanks, Pete. Thanks, everyone, for joining at this different time today for the colloquium. I wanted to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Allison Nugent. She is an assistant professor at the Department of Atmospheric Science at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And Allison got her PhD from Yale in 2015 um, in the Geology and Geophysics Department, and her master's in the same department as well. Her bachelor's is from the Earth and Planetary Science Department at Harvard, and she's been Actually, how long have you been at Hawaii now, Allison? A few years? Almost four. About four years. So she, Allison has a, a wide range of expertise. Uh, she, she focuses a lot on orographic connection and aerosol impacts, working a lot with developing and teaching with uh, meteorological instrumentation. She's been in a lot of different field campaigns, um, everything from the Domex, the Dominica experiment, to Deep Wave in New Zealand. Um, and she'll talk a little bit about things looking forward to other projects as well. Um, she's an excellent teacher and won a teaching award uh, this past spring and puts a lot of effort into her students. And we're just grateful to have her here to be talking about aerosols around Hawaii. Yeah, so, thank you so much for the introduction, Angela. Um, let me share my screen. Can everybody see my screen? Yep, that looks great. OK, awesome. So yeah, first I want to thank Angela so much for inviting me to give this presentation to you today. Um, I'll be talking about two specific projects, which are actually the first two projects that I have students on that, is, that are getting published. So for me, both of these projects are really meaningful. Uh, both of them have been, one, one was submitted yesterday <laughs> to JTEC and one was submitted in August to Jazz. And so I'm really happy to finally be getting to the point where my students are doing research and publishing things. So I'll certainly give them credit where it's due. But today I'll talk about two very different projects that are both focused on aerosols in Hawaii. So from sea salt to volcanic emissions. And before I move on, I want to kind of highlight this picture. I took this picture on a commercial flight from, I don't know, Oahu, maybe it was to the mainland, mainland, I don't recall, but it shows really nicely where we're situated. So Waikiki Beach is here. Downtown Honolulu is about five kilometers to the west. Diamond Head Crater is here, and the University of Hawaii campus is kind of up in Manoa Valley. So that's where the name comes from, University of Hawaii at Manoa, because we're in this in this valley and I'm located just behind the campus kind of further up into the valley but you can see the really nice orographic clouds and just it's so wonderful to be living in a place that's really um, where the where what I research is so closely connected to what I experience from day to day so my research lab is mainly focused on mountain meteorology and cloud micro and in the word cloud pun intended, you can see the, the size of the word um, shows how frequently that word shows up in abstracts that I've submitted to conferences, papers. And you can see there's a really large cloud, precipitation, convection, mountain, orographic, observations, tropical. So you get a sense that my work is tropical, orographic, precipitation, aerosol cloud interactions, and, and so on from this word cloud. And in particular, currently I'm working on a number of projects one is one I've gotten to know Angela much better um, is this precip prediction of rainfall extremes in the Pacific field campaign. It was supposed to be in 2020 summer and it was postponed until next summer 2021. So hopefully Angela and I will get to hang out with the SPOL radar for a long period of time in summer 2021. And I'll also be I'm also actively working on the sea salt aerosol project. That'll be the topic for the first part of today's presentation. I'm also working on trying to collect rainwater to see how much salt is up in the up in the clouds and in the precipitation that falls to the ground. Another area of interest of mine is Hawaiian weather and rainfall. I have an ongoing project looking at flood man management on Kauai, and I'm also working on building up radar climatology and feature tracking for the operational radars here on Hawaii. So. 
before I get started, I want to give a, a really general introduction just to make sure everybody's on the same page. So aerosols are small particles suspended in the atmosphere. They come in a range of sizes. So here I have nucleation mode, Aitken mode, accumulation mode, and coarse mode. And that's shown on this plot down here at the bottom in the number that they exist in the atmosphere and then the volume that they take up. So for example, coarse mode are large, but they're, they're very few in number, but they're large in volume in the atmosphere. So the, this is important because the effect that aerosols have on the atmosphere differs depending on their size and composition. So through today's presentation, I'll talk about two types of aerosols. In the first part, I'll talk about sea salt, which again are low in number but large in volume. And in the second part, I'll talk about uh, volcanic emissions, which exist in this accumulation mode. They're still kind of large, but not as large as coarse mode, but they're more numerous. So the reason that I care about aerosols in the atmosphere has to do, or, or the reason I care specifically, is because they affect clouds and therefore precipitation that results from those clouds. So this is just a general uh, background slide with an image from Stevens and Feingold 2010, where it points out the difference between a clean atmosphere and a polluted one. So clean meaning not very many aerosols, polluted meaning a lot of aerosols. When you have a clean atmosphere, not many cloud condensation nuclei, you can get larger cloud droplets, which produce more rain and results in less cloud overall because the cloud water tends to rain out. But in a polluted atmosphere, you end up with smaller, more numerous cloud droplets that have a harder time forming rain through collision coalescence because there's just more of them and they're smaller, so they don't collide as frequently. It takes more of them to coalesce to form a raindrop. So clouds are persisting longer. So this is the background behind why I'm interested in in aerosols in the Hawaiian atmosphere is to try to understand precipitation impacts on orograph precipitation. So in this first part, I'll show you a bunch of observations of sea salt aerosol size distributions in Hawaii. And this work is the work of two of my students, Aaron Tang and Katie Ackerman, shown here on the left. And this work was made possible by an NSF eager grant. Eager grants are for risky but potentially transformative research. So I submitted a proposal saying I'd really like to build this instrument, but I don't know if it's going to work. And NSF thought, well, if it did work, that would be pretty amazing. And so recognize that this was from an eager grant. The instrument development um, came, apart, came about as a part of that. And before I move on, I'll again look at this picture in the background. This is the Nepali coastline of Kauai. And what I want you to see in this picture is that in the foreground, the land looks darker. And as you go towards the distance, it gets brighter. And that's because there's sea salt in the atmosphere. We're, we're out in the middle of the Pacific. There's hardly any anthropogenic influence. And so what you're seeing here is the influence of sea salt in the atmosphere that's brightening the background. So even though you can't see it, we have ocean, we have waves hitting up against the coastline. You can kind of see in these, in these valley regions or inlet regions that there's even more. So keep that in mind as we move forward, that sea salt comes from the ocean surface, or sea salt aerosol comes from the ocean surface. It can come from a number, a number of different ways or methods to get to the atmosphere. You have bubbles that come up to the surface of the ocean, and they pop, producing the smallest type of sea salt aerosol called film drops. Film drops have a size less than half a micron and last in the atmosphere for about one and a half weeks. Then this bubble exists, or this, this cavity exists from this popping bubble, and water rushes in to fill it, producing jet drops. So it rushes in, kind of gets ejected into the atmosphere, producing jet drops, which are larger and therefore have a shorter residence time because they fall out due to, due to gravitational settling. And then there's a, a third type called spume drops, which are when wind rips salt off the surface of the ocean. These are really large drops and therefore last just a really short period of time. So I'll be focusing on this jet drop category, which have a size from about half to 12 microns and last in the atmosphere from about five to 15 hours. So 
Sea salts are a really special type of aerosol. They're naturally comprised of sodium chloride, as you might expect, but sodium chloride is super hygroscopic, meaning that it's, it really likes water. It, the, the, the aerosols grow quickly with water. And so what you're seeing in this image is relative humidity on the x-axis and particle mass change on the y-axis. What I want you to get out of this image is that even at 40-50% relative humidity, the salt is already double its size because it's taken on so much water. At 80% relative humidity, the sea salt aerosol would be four times its size because it's so hygroscopic. And it just, so even below cloud base, salt grows in the atmosphere. So that's a key point. Another reason we're looking at salt is that they're the dominant aerosol in the marine atmosphere. So this, image, this video is showing salt, sea salt in blue, and you can see it's pretty ubiquitous, and salt scatters radiation, affects visibility, and radiative forcing through the direct effect. It also partakes in troposphere chemistry, and again, it can act as cloud condensation nuclei for clouds, and therefore affecting cloud albedo and the radiation budget through indirect effects. So that's why I'm particularly interested in salt. Also, large sea salt aerosols of the size range 1 to 15 micron can act as giant cloud condensa condensation nuclei. So it's, they're really large cloud condensation nuclei. And when you have cloud droplets that form these GCCN, these cloud droplets grow quickly, even more quickly than regular ones, into precipitation-sized drops. So if you imagine the salt is coming in in the atmosphere, being lifted up by the mountains, you can get to precipitation sizes much faster. So ultimately, we need observations of GCCN to properly model clouds and precipitation processes in marine areas, especially along orographic coastlines. So the background for this, there's ultimately, we, for warm rain to form, we need to broaden the cloud droplet size distribution in order to initiate collision and coalescence. There's two main theories for spectral broadening. The first has to do with sea salt aerosols. Sea salt aerosols can enhance condensational growth of some of those drops formed on sea salts due to the salt's hygroscopicity, therefore getting large enough drops that can get out. The second is in cloud turbulence. You, if you can enhance the speed of collision and coalescence by facilitating collision, then you can potentially get precipitation to form pretty quickly. So once a large droplet forms, then precipitation can initiate. So I'm focused here on this first theory. And I want to ask just some basic questions like, well, are sea salt aerosols even able to make it up into cloud base, which in the Hawaiian region is 100 to 900 meters? And if it can, how does sea salt aerosol size and number depend on altitude, distance from shoreline, or other environmental conditions? So these are just really basic questions of, is there salt in the clouds? Is it making it there? So the reason that this is a particularly difficult question to approach is that the size distribution of sea salt is notoriously difficult to measure. And this is for a number of reasons. One is because optical probes that look at small cloud droplets, which are the size of these sea salt aerosols, they don't measure salt concentration or aerosol composition. So there could be aqueous salt in a cloud droplet or not, but an instrument like the CDP would not know the difference. Second, it's difficult to observe because if you're trying to observe sea salt aerosols as aerosols, well, most inlets on, like this one on the, the, the low turbulence inlet on the, on the NCAR aircraft, they're looking for smaller particles. And so if you have a large sea salt aerosol zooming into this, it's not gonna make it around that bend. So inlets suffer from large particle losses, losses because they have high inertia. And ultimately, it's because GCCN sit right in the middle of the size range between aerosols and cloud droplets that it makes them really difficult to observe and measure. The current method, the best method to do this is with the giant nucleus impactor on an NCAR aircraft. So this image is showing the side of an aircraft with a pole sticking out. I believe this was from the RICO field campaign. So I know some of you have learned about that from, from Angela. And on the end of this stick, for lack of a better word, is this polycarbonate slide. 
this polycarbonate slide is exposed to the free airstream during flight. You just stick it out the window <laughs> or out the, out the hole in the side of the plane and sea salt aerosols impact onto the slide. Then you take this slide back to the lab and image the sea salts on them. And the result is the size distribution of sea salts aerosols. It's currently the only mechanism to get the size distribution of these large coarse mode sea salts aerosols. You can get mass in other ways, you can get reflectivity in other ways, but to get the size distribution, this is the only way. So currently these aerosol sampling techniques require aircraft which are limited in space and time. So the goal of this work was to create a new low cost instrument to observe the sea salt aerosol size distribution that did not require aircraft so that we could determine which environmental variables influence the sea salt aerosol size distribution in a coastal environment. So jumping straight into it, then, this is the instrument that was developed as a result of the NSF eager funding. So you see the same polycarbonate slide on the arm of this instrument. We have an Arduino microcontroller with a servo motor that rotates this door open and shut. We use a long range radio to communicate with this instrument from the ground. And the real time clock on board records pressure, temperature, and relative humidity. So this is the mini GNI, miniature giant nucleus impactor. And the way that we use this is we go to the beach <laughs> and we sample on the windward coastline of Oahu. So Manoa is right around here. We drive around to the other side. We fly a kite along the coastline in the uninterrupted trade wind flow. So here we have a kestrel situated on a picnic table. We have an electric fishing reel with a kite line attached to it. Here's a, we use a Delta Conine kite, and there are one, two, three, four, five instruments attached to this kite string that where the highest one is around maybe 600 meters or so. So through this methodology, we can sample under a range of seasons, times of day, and various environmental conditions. So let me show you a time series from these five instruments of what this looks like through time. So time is on the x-axis, altitude is on the y-axis. Each color represents different mini GNI instruments. So we start out, all the instruments are initiated, they're on the ground. Then we send one of them up, then attach the next one 50 meters later, then the next one 50 meters later. When I say 50 meters, I'm referring to the line length, the string line length in between. And once they're all at the desired altitude, then from the ground, we open the doors and we sample sea salt aerosols for a 10 minute period. Then we bring the instruments down, reattach new slides, send them back up again, sample. So same thing. So on one day, we can repeat the analysis three times, get five altitude, altitude samples of sea salt aerosol size distribution simultaneously and bring these back to the lab to analyze them. So to give you a little bit of a better idea, this is an older instrument that actually used a kite attachment, but check this out. You have the instruments attached to the kite. You can see as the door open, the slide is exposed to the atmosphere. Then after some desired period of time, we close the door and bring the instrument in, attach new slides, and so on. So the slides are then stored in desiccant and sent to NCAR for reanalysis, for, for analysis on the GNI microscope. They're placed in a controlled humidified chamber with the sea salt aerosols again. So salt particles deliquesce into spherical cap drops, whereas other particles form irregular droplets. So the image on the right is from the microscope. And you, this is one of like 300 images that are taken on this slide. The microscope automatically images, counts, and sizes all the particles on the slide. And the number concentration is, is, is counted from the equation at the bottom. Now, one big issue is the collision efficiency. This is a strong, indica or a strong factor in the equation to calculate number concentration. So collision efficiency is calculated using a, an old equation in 1952. And the reason this is important is because the collision efficiency or the ability for salt particles to impact onto the slide is 
a function of how fast those particles are moving, the so in speed on the y-axis, and how large the particles are, the drag radius on the x-axis. So for example, at the average trade wind speed of about six meters per second, you only have about 40 to 50% collision efficiency for a four micron size sea salt aerosol. So we're really good at observing the larger sizes, but we have to have a cutoff around three or four microns due to the collision efficiency. And that's because smaller particles will just zip around the slide because they have lower inertia, while larger particles are more likely to impact onto the slide due to their high inertia. Okay, so let me show you some results. I'm gonna show you an image, a video in the next slide where you'll see the instruments moving along this blue line, which will not be there. So I'm here in this orange shirt, you have Tian Chi and Aaron and my little Rav4. And so let me start the video. Watch right here, you, you'll start to see an instrument move up the, up the line. So size distributions are available from 95 slides. These were taken during summer and winter, 2019, 2020, from altitudes of 15 meters to 638 meters. We also sampled wind speeds from two and a half to six meters per second and waves from 1.3 to 3.6 meters. So the results will be shown in figures that look like this. Keep in mind that, so dry radius, the x-axis, cumulative number concentration is on the y-axis. So it's cumulative up to the left you'll see a number of different colored lines. Those show the altitude that the sample was taken at. And there's a number of samples grouped together. So N equals six means six samples were averaged between this, size, between this altitude range. Note that we're looking at dry radius. And remember the, the residence times for dry radius were five to 10 hours for a four micron size or less than five minutes for a 16 micron size. So these larger sizes are really short-lived in the atmosphere. They're probably produced right along the coastline through breaking waves, and we're measuring them right as they come up into the atmosphere. The typical aerosol size, recall, for the accumulation mode is 0.1, so that is not shown on this plot. We're looking at the larger, the larger part of the coarse mode region for aerosols. Note that a typical cloud droplet size is around 10 to 50 microns. And so this barrier right here, around 10 microns, these would be considered cloud droplet size. These large aerosols are cloud droplet size. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Here we have the dependence of sea salt aerosol on altitude. So again, the different colors show different altitude ranges. So red, is near the ground surface. Black is at 614 to 638 meters, higher, high up in the atmosphere. So generally we find that there are fewer and smaller sea salt aerosols found at altitude, which makes sense because you have gravitational settling, they also don't live as long. But we do find that there are some large sea salt aerosols, 16 micron dry radius, this one down here, that were found at altitudes over 400 meters. So we know that some of these large sea salt aerosols are making it up to cloud base. And this is consistent with prior work. When we look at the relationship between altitude and number concentration, total number concentration on, a, on each slide, we find that there is somewhat of a relationship. At lower altitudes, we have more numerous sea salt aerosols, but the relationship is more complicated than that because look at this R squared value. It's not particularly great. So let's look at some, uh, some other variables. Let's look at the dependence of sea salt aerosols on speed. So you might expect that with larger or with stronger winds, you have, would have more larger sea salt aerosols. But we have a pretty small wind range. We just have from three to six meters per second wind. And that's partly due to the fact that we can't fly a kite in low winds and that stronger winds tend to be more turbulent and not very good for sampling. So this looks pretty messy. These are all individual samples. You can see somewhat of a dependence, but if I do the same averaging thing that I did with the altitude ranges, they kind of all collapse onto each other. So here the red line is three to three and a half meter per second winds. Purple is five and a half to six meter per second winds. They kind of all collapse right onto each other. And what I'm showing in the background is 
from Woodcock, 1953, where he did some similar work looking at sea salt nuclei in the marine air as a function of altitude and wind force. So all of our lines collapse onto this nine meter per second wind force variable from Woodcock's estimates from the 1950s. So this isn't looking so great, right? <laughs> like you might expect a larger variation, but I'll note that uh, Alfred Woodcock did not measure wind speed at that time. He just looked at how strong the wind felt or what the waves looked like. And so I think that we can do better. So here's the same type of plot that I showed you for altitude. Here I have surface wind speed on the x-axis and number concentration on the y-axis. And there is no relationship here. So lack of an instantaneous wind relationship was somewhat surprising because when you look at numerical models, the sea salt aerosol source function in models is dependent on effectively wind speed alone. It's effect it's based on the white capping or yeah the white capping area coverage so how much white water you have at the surface which tells you about the bubbles which tells you about the source right but instantaneously if you look at one versus the other in our data set we find no relationship so we did something else we thought well what about the wind history so now on the x-axis instead of the instantaneous wind measured at the time of sampling we take the 12 hour average wind from the nearest weather station and put that on the x-axis instead. So here you see that the relationship changes from a 0.3 R squared value to 0.25. So it's doing a little bit better, but it's still not great. There must be something else going on. So the next step then was to connect the sea salt directly to wave height. And here we see the best plots that we can or, or, or so far, the best plots that we know of that we can make. So again, dry radius on the x-axis, cumulative number concentration on the y-axis. The red line is the lowest wave heights. So this is the significant wave height of 1.3 to 1.4 meters. Then in green is the largest wave height of 3.2 to 3.6 meter significant wave height. And we see this pretty big separation from the, the high waves producing large amounts of salt to the lower waves producing less salt. So what we find is that longer term wind is associated with a longer fetch. So taller waves mean more larger sea salt aerosols in the atmosphere. But again, most models parameterize open ocean sea salt aerosol production by wind speed alone. But here we are in this coastal environment. So we have shallow waves and no models parameterize coastal sea salt aerosols, which I believe are important for orographic clouds. So we've been looking more and more into this idea that wave breaking along the shoreline increases the sea salt aerosol production in that location, and those sea salt aerosols are making it up to cloud base. So this is an area that I find super interesting. Here, here you see significant wave height on the x-axis, number concentration on the y-axis, and a pretty strong relationship. It doesn't explain all of the variants, but it's doing a pretty good job of explaining a lot of it. And one thing that I think is a bit confusing is that normally you would think, well, they're directly connected to the wind speed in the location that they are. But in the Hawaiian Islands, we have waves that come from mid-latitude frontal cyclones that are at 40, 50, 60 degrees north and send their waves our way through swell. And so sometimes the wind and the waves are connected, but sometimes they're not connected. And so this is something that I'm interested in, in looking at more as we go forward. So we hypothesize that coastal sea salt aerosol size and numbers are higher than in the open ocean. So do we need a different coastal or wave height driven sea salt aerosol source parameterization along coastlines? We're still working on collecting additional observations to determine the sea salt aerosol size distribution under a wider range of conditions. And I wanted to note that this mini GNI design and all of the methods are open source. So our goal is to increase the number of sea salt aerosol operations worldwide. The cost of creating your own mini GNI is like $20, including the cost of 3D prints. So if you're interested in checking this out, I have it all up on my GitHub page. So conclusions. Are sea salt aerosols able to make it up to cloud level? Yes, we find large sea salt aerosols above 600 meters. 
And then how does the sea salt aerosol size and number depend on various parameters? Well, the observed sea salt aerosol increases in size and number with decreasing altitude, with increasing wind speed, with increasing wave height, and with distance to shoreline. That's something that I haven't shown you yet. And this has big implications for coastal orographic clouds that are likely to have their sea salts, that are likely to have sea salt aerosols involved in their cloud microphysical processes. We've already shown that when sea salt aerosols are present, when clouds grow, condensational growth is enhanced. So I hypothesize that sea salt aerosols contribute to the rapid formation of rainfall along coastal mountain ranges. So going forward, we're doing a number of other things associated with this work. We're building an anemometer that we can use on the kite string. So this is not the mini GNI. This is a, a, an anemometer built off of a um, computer fan. And we've flown this in oh, along the kite string. And we find that our winds match really well with a log law rather than the power law, which was something we had assumed prior. So we're able to check some of our observations. We're also working on sampling sea salt aerosol offshore by drone to determine the difference between marine and coastal concentrations. So you can see here's a drone and here's two mini GNIs hanging under it. This is Katie Ackerman's work that um, will be you know, ramping up going forward. So here's a, just a visual of that. We can see our offshore trade winds coming from the left and we can sample with our drone out over the open ocean then within the reef, within the lagoon, and on the shore to see how the sea salt aerosol size distribution changes with distance to shoreline. So this is some work that's ongoing currently. If you want to check it out, the, our paper, A New Instrument for Observing the Sea Salt Aerosol Size Distribution, was only submitted yesterday to JTEC. So um, it's not available yet. But if you're interested, I'm happy to send you more information. And again, I'd like to acknowledge the eager grant and I wanted to say, contact me if you're interested in sampling your own sea salt aerosols or if you want to collaborate on something where we have in situ observations from the ground. So, you know, maybe we could compare it with satellite images or something like that. OK, so that's the first part for sea salt aerosols. Now I'm going to switch gears and save questions to the end, if you don't mind, to talk about Tian Chi's work looking at volcanic aerosol emissions volcanic aerosol, aerosol emission impact on orographic precipitation in Hawaii. So this is my PhD student, Tian Shi Zuo, and this work was also done in collaboration with Greg Thompson at NCAR. So switching gears entirely now, again, here we are 2,500 miles to the mainland and few anthropogenic sources of aerosol. We have those sea salt aerosols that we already talked about, but there's not a lot of other aerosols hanging around. So the Kilauea volcano aerosol source is pretty significant in the local environment. So to give you an introduction, here are the Hawaiian Islands. I'm here on Oahu, but Hawaii Island, or also known as Big Island, is the one farthest, and farthest to the southeast and largest. And located along the southeast shore of the Big Island are two distinct degassing hotspots associated with the Kilauea volcano. So if you look at this image, this is zoomed in on, on Big Island, there's two big peaks over four kilometers, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa, but the Kilauea volcano is kind of on the flank of the southeast side of Mauna Loa volcano. Both of these larger volcanoes are dormant, but the most active one is Kilauea over here. And on the Kilauea volcano, there are two degassing hotspots. One is the, the lower east, side rift zone, which became really active in 2018. You probably saw it in the news. And the other is the summit of Kilauea, this location here. And you can see that degassing has been occurring over the last you know, 30, 40 years at these locations. So if you look at annual SO2 emissions from the Kilauea volcano from 1979 to 2016, you can see that the rift was really active in the 80s and 90s. And then the summit became more active in the 2000s, 2010s. And so these two spots have been degassing, kind of changing which one is uh, more dominant. But ultimately, oops, <laughs> ultimately, volcanic smog or VOG composed of both gas phase sulfur dioxide and sulfate aerosols are emitted from these two locations. So what can we do about it? Well, first, 
this has been noticed by local people. And if you talk to, you know, just local people in the grocery store, they'll say that um, the, vol the Kilauea volcano is reducing rainfall in Kona. So Kona is a, a region of the Big Island on the leeward side over here. And if you look at the mean annual rainfall for Big Island, it looks like this. So here you have our trade winds coming from the northeast. We have a lot of precipitation on the windward coastline of Big Island. It's pretty dry up the top that are above the trade wind inversion, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa. And then there's some precipitation on the lee side, but Kona is pretty dry already. And then if you look at rainfall trend maps from 1920 to 2012, you'll see that the during the dry season especially, the lee side of Big Island has been showing this downward trend in precipitation over the last century or so. So the question was, can VOG affect rainfall and contribute to this drying trend? And again, this was something that I found super surprising. Like people in the grocery store like told me that, that the volcano was reducing precipitation in Kona, but with no evidence and no study being done on this topic. So I thought this was really, I mean, you could think of it kind of as low hanging fruit, but also a really interesting question of looking into whether this is actually a thing or not. So going back to this image that I showed at the beginning, we were talking about sea salt aerosols before. And yes, they're aerosols, but they kind of contribute to this clean effect. They make larger cloud droplets. Whereas now we're in this bottom part of the plot where uh, sulfate aerosols act in the polluted sense. So uh, while Kilauea volcano provides this natural source of aerosol, the, it makes the atmosphere locally more polluted, which results in smaller cloud drops, potentially less rain and more cloud. So we're investigating this lower half of the plot. And there have been studies that have been done on this topic, maybe by some of you, that looked at the region downwind of Hawaii Island. It's a great natural case study because you have, you know, your clean ocean background, but no studies have been done looking at precipitation on the island of Hawaii. So again, locals hypothesize that VOG reduces rainfall on Big Island, but no scientific studies had been conducted. So we focus on the Big Island rather than the ocean downstream. This is because, you know, in a remote area like this, rainfall is a really vital natural resource and essential to replenishing our freshwater aquifers. And if there is decreasing rainfall over the past century, well, that's a big deal. So I'll focus on three research questions in this second part. Is there a connection between rainfall and VOG emissions? And I'll do this with both observations and a numerical model. And then I'll ask, well, how does VOG affect cloud properties? And does it affect rainfall amounts? And if so, where? So the observational data set that I'm looking at is I'm using daily rainfall gridded maps from Hawaii Island. This was work by Ryan Longman. He used these climate stations and made these really nice rainfall maps. And then I'm looking at Kilauea SO2 emission rates from the summit and the rift zone measured by the USGS. Now note that unfortunately, the only year that overlaps between these rainfall maps and the high quality emissions by the USGS is the calendar year of 2014. So here you see 2014 to 2015. I'm only looking at one year of observations. Unfortunately, we don't have observations from the USGS going back to the 19, 20, 30, 40, 50s, like we have the rainfall maps and the rainfall maps stop in 2014. They're currently developing later ones, but I'll compare these two in an observational sense, and then we'll look at the model. So first, zooming in on the Kilauea SO2 emission rates from the summit, here we have SO2 emissions as, as observed by the USGS over the calendar year of 2014-15. It's not every day, they go out maybe twice a week, depending on the weather. And you can see there's some days with high emissions, we'll call those polluted days, with SO2 emissions over 2,500 tons per day. We just chose some threshold. And then we'll compare rainfall on those polluted days, so the days up here, and we'll compare it to rainfall on the clean days with SO2 emissions less than 1,000 tons per day. And we'll see if there's any difference in the rainfall amounts on Big Island in those two conditions. So the next slide shows rainfall comparison between clean on the left and polluted days on the right. Again, this is referring only to the 
emissions from the Kilauea summit. What you see is this black area that's been circled really pops out in these rainfall maps. We see that the region downwind of Kilauea receives much less rainfall when volcanic emissions are high. And the rainfall differences for the rest of the island are small. So you still get precipitation on the windward slopes. That's pretty much about the same. That's because volcanic emissions don't depend on the weather. And so we're, when you separate out these two days, we see that we have like on average 12 millimeters per day in this region downwind of the Kilauea summit as compared to next to nothing. So we see evidence from the observations that, that the Kilauea volcano is impacting rainfall downstream. So that's the first part. Observations show that there is a connection. Now let's look at the model and see if we see something similar. So we used WARF. We used idealized simulations with two kilometer grid spacing. Here's the domain size. You can see there's these two tiny little stars show the place where we have emissions from the volcano. So we put in, we, we use the Thompson aerosol aware bulk microphysics scheme, and we actually add in emissions of aerosols to these locations. We run one diurnal day, 24 hour simulation using a classic trade wind sounding from HARP, the Hawaiian Rain Band project. And what we do is we just compare these separate experiments. Control has no emissions, and then we add in different levels of, of emissions to the simulation to see how it changes the clouds and the precipitation. So let's jump right in. Look at the 24-hour rainfall that's produced from these different simulations. Here's the control run on the left, and I'm only showing you the low aerosol emissions and the high aerosol emission case, again, from these two vents on the southeast flank of Mauna Loa. So what we find is that we get less rainfall in that same location that we saw in the observations downstream of Kilauea. The rainfall difference is on the bottom, and you can see that the location of the precipitation has also shifted downstream. You get less precipitation here and more over the ridge line. So we're seeing a rainfall shift and a reduction due to these volcanic aerosol emissions. When we look at the cloud microphysical impacts, you can see why. So the aerosols are really covering this downwind flank, which is producing large cloud droplet numbers and small cloud droplet sizes. So these aerosols are interactive in the, in the microphysics scheme in the model. The model results also show the temporal, and evolution, temporal evolution of cloud and rainfall processes. So we can see that the reason why we're getting different Precipitation is because the cloud is hanging on to that liquid water in the, in the polluted case. This red line is the higher emission case, which is reducing the auto conversion and accretion rate. Or, well, I mean, technically we're seeing higher cloud liquid water content because auto conversion is reduced. So the clouds are kind of hanging on to that water longer and then resulting in different surface rain rates, lower surface rain rates when you have more pollution or more emissions. So question two, how does VOG affect cloud properties? Well, we're seeing that we're increasing the cloud liquid water content when we have higher emissions, which increases the cloud number concentration and therefore also drop evaporation and decreasing the rate of rainfall production. When we look at Hofmuller diagrams for these two cases, so the top one is control, this one's high emissions. Time is on the Y axis and the location along the X axis is the location along this black dashed line in the image. So what you're seeing is that the 24 hour rainfall total along that line decreases with increasing emissions and shifts downstream over the topography. So the timing and location of rainfall varies due to microphysical feedbacks from the aerosol loading. And in the polluted cases, rainfall maxima shifts downstream and occurs later. So that's question three. How does VOG affect rainfall and mountain location? Well, we're seeing that the numerical results show that the VOG delays rainfall, reducing the amount and causing it to fall further downstream. When we compare the model with air quality, this is one of my favorite, favorite slides and favorite figures because it's, it's super cool. Here you see three specific locations. So the yellow star refers to this top plot, the blue star to this bottom plot, and so on. So we looked at the Department of Health air quality SO2 observations averaged over 
a five-year period. So we have SO2 is the line, and then time of day in local time is the x-axis going towards the right. So what we see is there's an increase in SO2, or poorer air quality, in the morning, it rapidly decreases. And this is what's observed. Now if we look in the model, we see the same thing. We have increased aerosol loading in that location downwind of Kilauea, which then reduces afterwards. And the reason it reduces is due to diurnal effects of wind. So you can see that from these observations from the same DOH station, we have offshore winds in this location in the morning. Then we have upslope winds. So we're mixing the aerosol further upstream, mixing it in a, in a deeper boundary layer, and the, they connect super well. So it really provides high confidence in the work simulations and really connects the results to the human experience. Okay, so the conclusions from this part two are that observations and WARF both show Big Island rainfall is modulated by SO2 emissions downwind of Kilauea. We see the observed daily rainfall difference in observations, and we see the same thing in the, our sensitivity simulations in the WARF. I don't want to read all the rest. I think it's a little bit repetitive, but model results show VOG reduces and delays rainfall. The diurnal aerosol variations show that these sea breeze circulations affect where VOG moves. And note that we don't really see an impact on Kona rainfall, but it may be because of our short-term 24 simulations, or it may be because we're seeing a different type of, or like recirculation of aerosol in the lee side of the Hawaiian Islands that, or, or, or of the island of Hawaii, that makes things a little bit maybe delayed in time, or we're, we're kind of teasing into this question of Kona rainfall because we don't see that in our simulations or in the observations. But that's what the what the local knowledge tells you. So that's something we're still working on. These are the references for this second part of the study. Um, again, this paper, Volcanic Aerosol Impacts on Hawaiian Island Rainfall, has been submitted to JAZZ. It's under the um, undergoing revisions right now after review. So putting it all together, I just wanted to remind you again that VOG is in this accumulation mode. That's the volcanic smog. And sea salt aerosol is in this larger mode. And the effect that aerosols have on the atmosphere depends on their size and composition. So VOG tends to reduce precipitation, whereas sea salt aerosols may enhance precipitation. So it's really interesting once you dig down into the topic of aerosol cloud interactions, it's more complicated than you might think. So again, sea salt aerosols are this top plot, VOG is this bottom, bottom part of the graphic. And ultimately, my research is focused on, around the idea of what factors set or influence rainfall distributions on the islands. So I'm really interested in the influence of orographic dynamics, aerosols, hurricanes and other disturbances, and then climatology, rainfall, and, and climate. And so I also have a number of other areas. I kind of want to give you a quick overview of some things that I've been working on. Um, I have a free online textbook that I created for my Atmo 200 atmosphere processes and phenomena course. It's open, it's an OER, open educational resource, so you're welcome to use it, you know, take it, make it your own, talk to me about it if you think the content might be helpful for your class. I'm happy to work with you to, to port it over to your server and make it your own. You can really do some really amazing things with OER work. I also wanted to mention that for my class, I've created over 130 individual lesson video. So you can see on the right is just an example, like this dry adiabatic lapse rate, uh, work done, first law of thermodynamics. They're, they're handwritten and voice narrated on an iPad using Khan Academy style. This is where most of my effort has gone this semester. So you can find it on my website, alisonnugent.com, or you can find it on this um, unlisted YouTube playlist. So what, if you have the videos, you can, or if you have the link, you can see the videos. But um, it could be a nice review for students, or maybe you could just use these videos so that you don't have to teach that content in your class, for example. Um, also, I wanted to mention that here in the Hawaiian Islands, I'm the local news correspondent for Channel 2 News. So here I am during Hurricane Lane, doing on-air on narration about the ongoing impacts of Hurricane Lane, shown here. And so one of, the, one of my areas of passion is really um, science communication and you know, 
doing these kinds of media and public science interactions. So if this is something that you're interested in, please reach out to me. I have some experience in it, and I'm happy to give you some tips of what you should or should not say to reporters when they call. Um, so with that, I want to thank you so much for, for listening. I hope I saved a few minutes for, for some questions, but please check out mine and my students' work. Um, my most recent publication is this Fire and Rain, The Legacy of Hurricane Lane in Hawaii. So you can check that out in BAMS. It came out over the summer. You can email me, find me on Instagram, on Facebook, or check out my website. So if you didn't sign up for a meeting with me, but after hearing my talk, you'd like to, or you'd like to talk to me about science education or outreach or OER resources, please email me. I will have some time over the next few days to, to meet with you. And really, that's what I love the most out of doing these types of remote visits is trying to get to, to know you all. So please reach out. Thanks again for listening. Thank you so much, Allison. And I don't know if you can see the applause in the uh, chat, but that's what all the noises are. There's lots of little clap emojis. That's been our, our way to express our, our thanks. I hear a little ding, ding, yeah, ding. Yeah, it's going. going. Um, but this is a great opportunity to answer questions or ask questions. Oh, I see. Oh, I just lost the hand. Um, someone just had a question, and I'm not sure where the hand went. So if you just raise your hand, go go for it. Maybe it was a mistake. Apologies if I missed it. <laughs> Maybe they were trying to clap when they hit the, <laughs> yeah. the hand up. <laughs> um, all right. Do we have questions for Allison? This was a really, really interesting talk. Grant, go ahead. Hi. I, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, and it made me think of uh, a, a trip that I took to Hawaii a few years ago. Actually, I've gone a few times. But this one was to uh, Maui. And um, we visited the summit of Haleakala, the volcano. and one thing that we noticed is that we had been experiencing rain as we went up the slope of the, the mountain. Then we broke out of the cloud at the top and we went to the top and spent the day up there. When we came back down again, uh, we descended from very clear air into the cloud. And very soon after we got below the cloud top, it began to, to heavily drizzle. I could still see the sun through the cloud, so it was clearly not very far below the cloud top that we were seeing drizzle. And I basically concluded that it must be really, really clean air and so we had very high precipitation efficiency, so that we're getting rain out of very uh, tenuous clouds, or at least not very deep at the level that we were. And I can imagine that any kind of contamination by bog or anything else would probably radically change the precipitation in that situation. And so this is really more of a comment than a question, but I'm just wondering if that's a location that might be a, a good place to look for that specific influence. Yeah, so Haleakala on Maui is not an active volcano, so there's like you wouldn't have seen any emissions or anything there. But, but I, I think what your what your comments makes me think is that like yes, the Hawaiian Islands are an amazing natural laboratory for this type of research. And so some of some work that I haven't partaken in, but I'd like to, is you know driving up and down the slope of say Haleakala or through the saddle on Big Island. Um, because you can, you could, like you're saying, you descended from this clean air and the trade wind, above the trade wind inversion, down through the cloud, and yeah, it's super clean air that's producing precipitation. Things that I think probably, I don't know, maybe 50, 100 years, people would have, uh, 50 or 100 years ago, people would have said that it's not possible to get rain out of clouds like that, right? Um, so I don't know that Maui would be a good location for VOG work, but um, certainly looking into the, the production of warm rain through clean clouds is something you can do really well here. Did I did I kind of miss your question or, <laughs> or was it more no, interesting? No, you pretty much got it. I, I, yeah, I, I knew that, that polyocula wouldn't produce a bog itself, but I thought that if there were anthropogenic or other aerosol sources in the neighborhood, maybe when the wind flow is the right direction that, that mm -hmm. polyocula picks up something from another location, you might see that effect very strongly um, in the behavior of the clouds. Um, and it mm. seemed like a fairly easily observable location. So that was just a thought. But I, I'm not that familiar with the islands. Yeah, so Maui is, so, so the, the Hawaiian Islands has a population of about 1.2 million. And about 
1 million or 900, at least 900,000 of that is on Oahu. So Maui is not particularly populated, although it is the second most populated after Oahu. And so, so Oahu is a good place actually for looking at those anthropogenic emissions. And um, a colleague in the geography department has some rain gauges on Mount Ka'ala, on the, like, the mountain on the west side of Oahu. And when his student looked at weekly cycles, he found that there was some weekly cycle of precipitation that on Monday to Friday that was different than the weekend. I think maybe there was more rainfall on the weekend than during the week or something like that. And so that's something that we haven't looked into yet, but um, that would be kind of like that idea where maybe during the week when you have lots of people driving, you have more anthropogenic emissions and it could have a really strong impact on these really pristine clouds otherwise <laughs> without those emission sources. So yeah, it's a good point. I, I don't, yeah, I haven't thought too much about Maui in terms of that, but there could be, could be. Yeah, thanks for the, thanks for the comment. Uh, wow, okay, let's start with Brad. So I was really intrigued by your ability to do the kite measurements, particularly as a function of altitude. What we had, we, we failed miserably at doing kite measurements of ozone along Lake Michigan, uh, looking at lake breeze. What do you attribute your success? Uh, what kind of kite <laughs> did you use? And how many, how many failed attempts did you have? <laughs> yeah, you know, it looks really, really great, right? Oh, you have to mute yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Can you mute? OK, thank you. I hate hearing myself, especially as an um, So yes, there, there were quite a few failed attempts and injuries along the way. Um, I think ultimately the what made this successful was finding this location that you know we tried I don't know if you can see my mouse but we tried there's a really nice park over here called Sandy Beach we tried flying at Sandy Beach Park we tried places along the leeward leeward coast but I think what's great about the windward side of Oahu is that you have this continuous incoming trade winds that then are lifted by the mountains and so we tried a whole bunch of different kites as well we chose this kite, it's called a Delta Conine kite. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but C-O-N-Y-N-E. It, it flies with a really high string angle and is particularly steady. When I tried Delta kites at first, those are just like, you know, the triangle kites. I had some really disastrous <laughs> sampling days where the kite would just dive and keep diving and then hit the ground. So the people at the Sea Life Park over here know me because I used to go to their property and pick up my kite <laughs> a couple times. Um, so yeah, I think, I think the Hawaiian Islands is particularly good because we have steady trade wind flow. Note that I have tried flying in stronger winds. So like, you know, 10, 12 meter per second winds, but when the winds are stronger, the atmosphere tends to be more turbulent. And so like, we're a bit limited by the by the wind speed, but but yeah, thank you for pointing that out. I actually have a student, David Deku, who did his master's work with me. Uh, he was my first master's student, and honestly, most of David and I's work through that was like finding a good place and getting better at flying kites, such that we could do it here. Also, I have a I have a fishing reel that was like two thousand dollars just for the reel. And I have like a kilometer of line. And so like getting getting some of these things that you don't have to wind in 600 meters of line made, made the research much more enjoyable. But yeah, there's a lot in here that you don't really see from, <laughs> from this presentation. Thanks. I, I, I will probably follow up with an email and pick your brains. Appreciate that. Yeah, sure. I wanted, I saw that uh, Ian had a question. I want to give him a chance to ask his before we wrap up. Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, hey, Allison. Um, I just had a general question about Hawaiian clouds. If, if you happen to see winds running parallel to the chain of islands, do you happen to see downstream different types of clouds um, just due to the difference between um, the surrounding uh, giant CCN population versus anthropogenic uh, CCN, which might be smaller? sort of like a reverse uh, lake 
like front cloud or something? Um, let's see. There's multiple parts of your question that I want to comment on. So one thing, let's see if I can, well, maybe I'll go back to the, the VOG intro. So one thing is that downstream of, of islands, you can see some really interesting cloud effects. This, this satellite image doesn't show it, but there are a number of satellite studies that have looked at downstream clouds. And, but I don't know that it's due to aerosols. It's more that downstream you have convergence behind the mountain, which makes these things called uh, cloud streets or, or cloud tails behind mm -hmm. islands. Um, I don't know of any differences. You, you kind of seem to refer to something like upwind of the, the island or, or on the island. They're, they're, but it's more dynamical than it is aerosol. So the Hawaiian rain band project really well characterized this, this rain band that forms on the windward side of Hawaii Island from, from drainage flow converging with trade wind flow. And so there, there are some really cool cloud features around islands. In terms of aerosols, though, um, you can see aerosol cloud interaction impacts downwind of the Hawaiian Islands. That, that was something I referred to, let's see, if I go to my this slide. So this, um, this Malavel paper and Yuan paper both look at the downstream region, downwind of the Hawaiian Islands, and you can see volcanic aerosol impacts on the trade cumulus downstream of the islands. So, um, it is visible downstream, but over the islands, I think they tend to look downstream because when you're looking from satellite images, it's helpful if the background is very, um, you know, similar color or of similar type, and so it's easier to look downwind. Did that your question, or did I miss it entirely? No, that was great. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, Allison. We'll wrap up, but I encourage anyone that has questions to please reach out to her and. Hopefully there'll be some good discussions today and tomorrow with, with Allison. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Have a good rest of your Monday. Bye-bye.